Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started today. And thank you all very, very much for attending this live mini webinar version of our Rainscaping Education Program. Uh, John Oreck and I are here today. We are the co-chairs of the Rainscaping Education Program. John is the Purdue Extension Master Gardener State Coordinator. And I'm Kara Salazar. I am Assistant Program Leader and Extension Specialist for Sustainable Communities with Purdue Extension and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Uh, this session is an introductory overview of our two-day, 15-hour rainscaping education program where we focus on providing an overview of rainscaping practices and then provide detailed information about rain gardens for design, maintenance, installation, and best practices. So today we're going to go through an overview of all of those aspects of rain gardens to give you just an introduction and a taste of what our 15 hour program is like. Uh, through this session, we're going to have two parts where John will provide the um, presentation of the first part. I'll do the second part of the presentation, and then we'll have some time for some question and answer. And as you have questions, please go ahead and type those into the chat. This session is also part of the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant Learning at Home series. So we'll have several other types of programs to offer in this short webinar live format. They'll also be recorded so that we can share them uh, for public viewing on our Sea Grant and Extension websites and YouTube videos as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to John to start the presentation. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Kara, and uh, thank you to all of you uh, joining us today uh, to learn more about uh, rainscaping practices for the home landscape. Again, we're going to give you just an overview of a two-day workshop that the Purdue Extension Rainscaping Education Program um, holds uh, for communities uh, throughout Indiana, and uh, so we appreciate you being here with us to learn, to just get a taste today of some of these rainscaping practices. So uh, first, the first and foremost uh, concept to understand is what is stormwater. Um, and stormwater is this water that flows over um, our landscapes and, and driveways and parking lots and streets and um, cannot soak into or infiltrate into the soil. So if we get a, a heavy rainfall event or snow melt event, and that precipitation, that water flows over the surfaces and it flows to um, stormwater drains, to drainage um, uh, ditches or swales that uh, then eventually move to natural bodies of water like lakes, streams, rivers, and so forth. So um, that is stormwater runoff. And um, that is a uh, the main concept of uh, rainscaping practices uh, in the home landscape is to try to um, catch that storm water um, in as close as possible to the places where it um, falls. So um, in the form of rain or snow melt. And uh, we'll talk more about why that's important here in just a minute. So as you, as you look at different um, landscapes, um, a more uh, Herb, a rural landscape in the upper left hand corner, as you can see, uh, very little impervious surfaces. So those impervious surfaces might be uh, roofs, sidewalks, um, uh, driveways, um, parking lots, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, areas where uh, water and uh, cannot infiltrate into the soil but runs off more readily. Um, in those rural areas, we see that we have less runoff uh, typically, and these are just approximate percentages in this particular diagram um, to illustrate that uh, in, in those rural areas, we, we probably have more infiltration, less runoff as we become more urban and our area of uh, impervious surfaces um, increases. Uh, then we have more of a concern for stormwater runoff uh, moving to those uh, streams, lakes, rivers, and other natural bodies of water. So why is this important? Well, we know that 
you know, as those populations increase and as our structures increase and as the uh, area of impervious service increases, as we saw by that uh, last diagram, the uh, stormwater uh, runoff or potential for that um, is certainly going to increase and because that water can't soak into the soil. And when it flows across uh, parking lots or driveways or sidewalks or uh, roofs even, it can take with it uh, dirt and debris, um, pollutants such as chemicals and nutrients and bacteria um, uh, flows with that water. And that water then flows into our um, surface waters, into these natural bodies of water that we use for um, fishing and for um, recreational purposes, for swimming, uh, and um, uh, that uh, feeds our, our natural wildlife. And um, and also in some cases is even used as a drinking water source. And so um, if we can minimize stormwater runoff from these urban areas where we have uh, large um, uh, surface areas where water cannot penetrate into the soil, um, then, then that would be a good thing because we're gonna help increase uh, water quality and preserve this uh, precious natural resource. And so th these urban areas where we have lots of impervious services and lots of, and lots of potential for stormwater runoff, uh, these make great areas for, um, for rainscaping practices to be um, performed in our home landscapes. So a little bit of perspective here with this particular slide as we, we do a little math uh, this morning um, and do some comparison. Um, if we look at one inch of rain um, from a rainfall event um, equals uh, approximately 0.62 gallons of water, storm water per square foot of roof. So if we have a one inch rainfall, about 0.62, a little over a half a gallon of rain, uh, storm water runoff uh, per square foot of roof. And so if we look at the uh, residential roof being an average of about 1,200 square feet, um, and we do the math, well, in a one inch rainfall event, the potential there is for up 744 gallons of storm water runoff just from that one rainfall event. And to give you some perspective, a uh, standard bathtub holds about 60 gallons of water. So we can see that, uh, you know, maybe just one roof, one rainfall event is uh, not, not a whole lot of water. I mean, it's only 744 gallons of water. Um, but if you think of neighborhoods and cities and towns and states full of these, uh, of residential structures of homes and, and other structures throughout those cities and towns and, um, in neighborhoods, then it can certainly, uh, this potential for stormwater runoff can really uh, add up. And um, so there's great potential here that if we each do our part, then we can help uh, solve uh, this problem or at least um, uh, mitigate some of the stormwater runoff in these areas. So let's look at a commercial situation. We have a large retail store that has a roof of over 200 thousand square feet in size um, parking lots over 350,000 square feet in size and then we look at the one inch of rainfall uh, equals 0.62 gallons of stormwater runoff per square foot and then we do the math well then we see a much larger potential here um, and so we're over 130,000 uh, gallons from the roof and over 200,000 gallons of stormwater runoff from the parking lot and um, you think of two uh, large commercial parking lots where there are lots of vehicles parked there, um, you know, potentially dripping uh, petroleum products and various things. There are a lot of potential for um, pollutants that could potentially go with that stormwater runoff um, to uh, to these natural bodies of water. So there's a there's more of a potential here, and it just gives you kind of a size comparison in volume comparison uh, between the two structures or, or situations. So um, in a, a rainscape, in a, a residential rainscape uh, situation or landscape situation, uh, what can we do as uh, homeowners? What are some 
um, strategies here to try to reduce the stormwater runoff from our um, uh, residential property. You know, we may not be able to do a lot um, to affect others, but we can certainly change our own practices. Uh, each homeowner can change their own uh, landscape practices to uh, help mitigate stormwater runoff and reduce it. And so here are some of the um, strategies here for um, uh, rainscaping strategies uh, for a home landscape. First of all, installing pervious pavement um, is uh, uh, something that, uh, that some folks do. And basically these are porous pavers. It's a special kind of um, paver that can be installed with a, um, a specific uh, uh, aggregate in between each paver. Um, and we have actually a neighbor here in West Lafayette down the street who they have a uh, pervious pavement uh, driveway. And uh, so this allows water to infiltrate in through the, the pavers, um, whereas a conventional concrete or, um, or um, a pavement driveway would not allow that. So that's one technique. Um, although maybe a, a little more expensive and, and a little more obscure can, can, you know, if you compare it to these other uh, strategies is one that we could do. Um, plant rain gardens, and we'll talk more about rain gardens here in a few minutes. These are structures, landscape beds that are specifically designed to capture rainfall, rainfall uh, where it falls or close to an impervious surface. It's actually most rain gardens are connected to a downspout on a home. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, we can certainly do whatever we can to conserve trees, shrubs, prairies, and meadows. And, and I'd say landscape plants and turf in general, if it's maintained well, um, can help with this infiltration. Um, you know, these landscape beds and turf areas aren't the best at collecting um, stormwater runoff or reducing it, but they do, they're one part of the full strategy. And if they're well maintained, um, and we are putting the right plants in the right place in our landscapes, then they can thrive in those, the roots and structures of those plants can certainly help uh, increase infiltration on our properties. The use of rain barrels, we see that quite a bit. Um, this is the collection of rainwater from a downspout that then can be used for ornamental um, uh, rain uh, landscape beds to, to as an irrigation source. Um, and um, that's certainly a, a technique that can collect rainwater and then use it later on for something else. That's rainwater that's not flowing to the stormwater drain. And so it's then being used back into the landscape bed. And reducing impervious services in general. Um, you know, as sidewalks and things don't have to always be um, pavement or uh, concrete. They could certainly be made out of an aggregate material like stone or gravel or mulch or something that's gonna increase infiltration on our home landscapes. Redirecting those downspouts into lawns or gardens is certainly a, a great way of doing this. You know, some of these downspouts are connected directly to stormwater drains. And so you can just basically disable that and then redirect um, the downspout uh, into your, your lawn or landscapes. And um, that certainly can help out. Uh, landscaping with native species, these are more deep rooted species and um, uh, they can uh, help uh, create deeper channels within the soil profile that helps uh, increase that infiltration of water into the soil. And, um, but in general, I would just say um, use plants, either native or uh, horticultural varieties that, that are well suited for the environment and for your situation. And, and again, those roots are really going to help out. But landscaping with native plants is a best practice when it comes to rainscaping. So being more aware of those sources for uh, native plants uh, species uh, would be a, a good thing to, to be able to incorporate more of them into your landscape when it makes sense horticulturally. So let's take a look at uh, um, rain gardens and look at an overview of rain gardens. And uh, um, 
a rain garden is it's basically a landscape structure that has a wide depression, a wide flat depression with a gentle sloping sides. So the rain garden is actually, if you look at the, the figures here on this slide, it really helps, but it is um, the one in the upper right hand corner uh, uh, shows that most rain gardens are actually connected to a downspout. So that roof is an impervious surface. Uh, water moves down through um, the downspout to the rain garden. And um, then the rain garden is designed to hold um, that water uh, for no more than 24 hours. So a rain garden actually needs to be well drained. And uh, we actually, or, um, Re recommend doing an infiltration test when you're placing your rain garden. I know we'll talk more about that in a little bit here, but um, to be sure that that soil is well drained. In some cases, the soil has to be amended uh, with uh, organic matter to uh, to help with the structure, soil structure and infiltration of the soil to help improve that. Um, a rain garden also has an outlet. So it has an area where if we get more water than uh, from a rainfall event than that particular rain garden can handle, um, then it overflows into the outlet and then that outlet can go out to the landscape uh, somewhere where that water can infiltrate into soil. And so that's that's typically what you see in a rain garden. But uh, rain gardens can collect um, surface runoff, uh, stormwater runoff from parking lots and uh, sidewalks and other impervious services. We just typically see them connected to a downspout. So in the, um, along the sides of the, the slope, if you look at the picture in the bottom uh, left of the slide here, it shows that there are plants that are able to grow an average dry soil and um, uh, more, a drier soil on the top and sides. And then we plant uh, native species usually in the bottom of the, of the rain garden, the depression of the rain garden, they're able to handle an average uh, a, a more moist soil. So because that area is going to be obviously moist more of the time. But um, and so that's uh, typically how it's designed. Uh, rain gardens are designed and, and sized based on the site and the size of the impervious surface to be drained into the rain garden. But the one thing about rain gardens is that some people get a bog or a wetland confused with a rain garden, rain gardens drain within 24 hours. Uh, that's the whole purpose of a rain garden. And so um, a, an area that's poorly drained in your landscape would not be a good location for a rain garden. So like I said, uh, rain gardens increase infiltration and reduce pollutants. Um, they absorb about 30% more water than equivalent turf area. Um, again, they're specifically designed to collect rain water and to allow it to infiltrate into the bottom of that rain garden. So they're specifically designed for that. And so they add that extra um, ability to reduce stormwater runoff. They provide some wildlife habitat. They're reduced to maintenance, but they're not maintenance free. Um, and we certainly do not want um, uh, rain gardens out there in our in our landscapes that are not well maintained because uh, that sends a, um, a, a bad message and, uh, and people don't want um, landscape beds that don't look well maintained. And so we wanna make sure that they're well maintained. So they still need some maintenance, some deadheading, some watering of plants the first season or two to keep them alive. And, and, um, and I think we'll talk more about maintenance here in a few minutes. So we talk a little bit about siding a ring, uh, a ring guarding, uh, choosing a good location. What what goes into that? I'll speak here just a little bit about that. Um, and the the first is you really need you really need to see where water flows on your property, and you may have a good. Uh, idea of where you want to put a rain garden. And, and so the best thing to do is to observe, observe your property during a rain event. And that would be the best way to see where the water flows. And that will um, give you some, some good knowledge of, of locations where you need to put your rain garden. You do need to make sure that rain gardens are placed at least 10 feet away from foundations of homes or structures and 20 feet from basements. They can actually improve um, 
or divert water from going to basements or crawl spaces, but they still need to be um, a safe distance away from these structures um, to be sure that we're not negatively uh, impacting uh, these structures. Avoid trees and septic, septic systems in, in ponded areas when you're placing a rain garden in a landscape. Uh, like I said earlier, ponded areas are not a great place because you want this you want this rain garden to drain. That's the whole purpose. And so maybe placing a rain garden, garden upslope from a poorly drained area might be a good idea um, to help uh, mitigate a drainage problem. Avoid trees because you can damage the tree roots and uh, septic systems. Uh, obviously, you can damage that structure if you're digging a rain garden. Uh, that's or it may not drain properly because of the continuous flow of water into that area. So those are just areas to avoid. A place downslope um, from where you're collecting water um, from your impervious surface. Uh, that makes sense because you want that water to flow into the rain garden. So you want it downslope. And definitely want to call before you dig um, to be sure that you're locating um, water lines and um, gas lines and uh, cable lines and that sort of thing. And then uh, you want to create an overflow as well uh, to be sure that that water, that rain garden, the water in the rain garden has somewhere to go if we get a large uh, rain event. And then consider mowing habits. So there will most likely be some turf surrounding some of these gardens. So you can see in this picture that um, they've created a, a not, they have not created enough space between uh, the shrubs here and the rain garden itself. So you want to consider maintenance of the entire landscape when you're placing the rain garden and constructing it and designing it. And um, that will help um, with the ease of maintenance down the road uh, and um, help that rain garden just thrive in that location as well. So if we look at uh, a property here, um, this is a residential property, and we consider, you know, where would water run off from this property? Well, we certainly have, we have sidewalks, we have a roof, um, we have a driveway, we have um, a sidewalk here in front of the house, we have downspouts here where we could connect to, um, and it seems that this is flowing uh, down uh, downhill from the front of the house uh, from this perspective and so we can see that we can we might have potentials here with each one of these downspouts in the front as potential locations uh, for a rain garden but also we can see that water probably flows downhill from the downslope from those areas and then we also have the sidewalk in front the driveway and um, and those would be those would be the areas where water would flow um, from that property. So that gives you somewhat of an idea of, of where stormwater runoff moves from this property and potential locations um, for rain gardens. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Kara um, for the second half of our, of our presentation today. Great. Thank you, John. And um, you're going to maintain the slide presentation um, controls. So um, you can just go ahead and keep advancing. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk about now um, sizing your rain garden. And this is where uh, the fun part starts, where you get to go out into the landscape and uh, thinking about where water's flowing and where you want to place your rain garden. And the very first thing you need to do is conduct an infiltration test. And you may need to do this a couple of times, uh, but if you find a place where you think you want to put your rain garden, uh, start with digging an eight inch deep and eight inch wide test hole. And you'll wanna fill that with water, observe it for about 12 to 24 hours. And you'll want to go back at a known interval of time and measure uh, how much that water has dropped. So you could go out, for example, um, after 15 minutes, after another half an hour, after an hour, and um, see and measure how far that's, that water is dropping. And hopefully it is draining after a 24 hour period of time. Uh, what, how, what that means then, and John, if you could advance the next um, click, 
uh, that provides us the depth of the garden. And we calculate that by inches per hours times 24 hours per day. And that tells you how many inches per day that you'll be draining. And this will provide then the overarching depth that you want to construct your rain garden. And this is really important uh, because this is what, how deep you're going to dig. Uh, most gardens are going to be four to eight inches deep when you do this calculation. Uh, if it's over 12 inches, you want to maintain it at 12 inches because uh, of safety reasons and other types of considerations. We um, make sure to construct rain gardens uh, no deeper than 12 inches, but most of them you'll be able to have infiltration between four to eight. And if you're not hitting that mark for your depth, then you might need to find another location or you can amend the soil and see how it's uh, draining and continue that process. To calculate then the rain garden area, uh, you obviously have already determined the depth from the calculation we just provided. And then you want to start thinking about sizing it to hold that one inch of rain. And John was talking about that earlier in the presentation. We have uh, water quality benefits from capturing that first inch or first flush of rain, um, both from water quality aspects, but also for flooding and um, quantity of water. Uh, we also have many rainfall events that fall within this one inch or less um, rainfall category. So rain gardens are really helpful uh, for those events and that's why we we also are thinking about overflows so that if you do have more than a one inch rainfall event then you have a place for the water to go too. Um, we're going to determine the next the impervious size um, that you're draining. Usually it's a sidewalk or a roof and you need to calculate um, calculate that so you have the accurate um, the accurate, accurate size. And that calculation is the square foot of drainage area divided by the garden depth. And that's how big your garden should be to capture that one inch of rainfall. And I'll show you then next on the next slide what this can look like. So this is um, a residential house. Um, we're interested in putting a rain garden on the, the back quarter of the home property there. And you're going to then uh, drain, you know that you're draining that square of roof to the rain garden. And you can use this through um, an application such as uh, Google Earth. You can uh, measure how, much, uh, how many square feet that is. And so then you can do the calculation of what your rain garden size should be. You can also walk around your property. We don't want anyone getting on the roof. <laughs> you can walk um, the, the length of your property and you can on the sides of the structure and you can also calculate that way too. Let's then next do an example. So this is what it would look like to calculate a rain garden area to capture one inch. So you're going to divide the area of the roof in square feet by the depth of the rain garden that you found from your infil infiltration test. And then that's your area of your rain garden. So for example, you have a 1500 foot, 1500 square foot um, area and you want to build a 10 inch deep rain garden. What's the area? that would be 1,500 square feet because we're dividing um, the home roof by the 10 inch rain garden depth. So it is a fairly simple calculation. We also then need to start thinking about preparing the soil and the garden bed. And this is a very important aspect uh, because we're wanting to think about how the rain garden is going to fit within the landscaping. And it, shapes of rain gardens can come in all kinds of forms and sizes. And before you start digging, you'll want to think about that and how it fits within your existing landscape structure. So a good thing to do is to use something like flags or a rope or a hose to look at the outline and see how the shape fits. You can also then use some marking um, spray uh, be, as you're, you're getting going so that you know exactly where your garden shape is going to be. You also then need to think about how you're going to get water to the garden. Um, and that you can have a few different types of ways to get water to the garden. You can see in the picture here, um, they have the downspout that's directed into the water. You may want to think of something like a bioswale or a dry kind of creek bed um, option of conveying water to the garden as well. And that needs to fit within your landscape too. 
And then it's time to dig. And as you're doing that shape, uh, digging that shape that you've identified, uh, you want to dig to the desired depth um, with the inlet and an outlet. You also want to make sure that it's the wide flat bottom depression. So you're going to over dig a little bit um, from a couple of inches into the soil. If you need to amend compost, you can put about two inches into that till it in and then make sure to grade it um, with that wide flat bottom depression. You also need to make sure you construct the berm on a downhill side because you do have to make sure that the water is going to stay within uh, that rain garden. Again, you need to um, amend soil as needed. You can over dig the base, but you also need to make sure that that final grade is the desired depth of the rain garden and using compost is a good way to do that. For amendments. Plant selection and installation is a really fun um, aspect um, uh, for designing your rain garden. It's also um, as important as the sizing and siding. Not only do you want to make sure that you're channeling and infiltrating water appropriately um, in the uh, location of the landscape that it's desired, but you also want to make sure that you have the plants that are correct and appropriate for each of the areas within the rain garden. The rain gardens have the different zones within um, the, the bottom, the sides, and the top that John had spoken about earlier. So we want to make sure that we're placing plants according to their moisture tolerance tolerances and that you're selecting the right plants for the right place. You also want to make sure that the plants you're selecting um, are appropriate for the different types of shade or sun preferences. Think about size too. Um, you want to see how, how the plants will fit within the landscape, but also how um, they are fitting together so that you're spacing appropriately. Uh, we never recommend, of course, invasive plant species, but there can be aggressive plants. So you'll need to look at the habit of the plants and you uh, may need to thin out or um, manage them so that they're not overtaking other desirable species too. Seasonal interest is another thing to think about. Uh, many times we're wanting to have a garden that has um, seasonal interest with different kinds of structure in the winter and different types of bloom patterns throughout the year. Um, if a rain garden is located near um, a sidewalk or a roadway, salt tolerance is a major consideration, especially if it's um, going to be treated in the winter. Some gardens may also have uh, the benefit of wildlife habitat. And so are you wanting to design a garden and attract wildlife there too? Again, all of these plants, um, all of these considerations um, come back to the right plant for the right place and how you want to design the garden for the different types of benefits that you'd like to see. At the end of the garden design process and the installation, you also want to put in two to three inches of mulch using the shredded hardwood bark because it will not float um, and it has a nice interlocking pattern and will stay in place. Uh, so keeping mulch on it, at least while the plants are maturing, are, is a, um, a, a practice that we recommend recommend. Maintenance for rain gardens, again, as John has um, shared uh, earlier, is a very important aspect because we want to make sure that rain gardens look intentional, look well maintained, so that they can uh, be an aesthetically pleasing type of landscaping option too. So within the first um, year or two, you absolutely need to water your new plants. Um, they need to make sure to be established um, and maybe even into year three if we have a dry, um, a dry summer. Uh, so taking care of those new plants while they're getting established is important. Uh, make sure to uh, remove weeds, especially in the first couple of years so that they're not overcrowding those beneficial species that you want to, um, to maintain as rain garden plants. And then you would also um, make sure to maintain them like you would any other garden. You can deadhead and remove um, vegetation on, um, seasonally. Sometimes people though like to maintain um, some standing plants throughout the winter so that there's wildlife habitat and seeds available. Adding mulch when you need to seasonally. And then a really important thing for the continued maintenance of rain gardens is to remove the debris from the inlet and overflow pipes so that water is flowing into and out of the rain gardens appropriately. 
And to wrap up, uh, we'd also like to share with you a little bit about our Purdue Rainscaping Education Program. Again, we've provided just an introduction or a taste, as we like to say, of the information that we shared during this two-day, 15-hour um, session. And so each of the topics that John and I mentioned are divided up into four different modules. Uh, we then um, end the program with um, this demonstration rain garden opportunity, which you can see in the photo here. Uh, typically, we run the program over two consecutive days, and it's about seven and a half hours each uh, for that program. And so the sessions cover the introduction uh, to rainscaping and rain gardens, as well as the benefits. Um, and we also go through more in-depth information about stormwater management. The second session covers site selection and sizing. Uh, which we have also touched on today. Plant selection and garden design is session three, and we have hands-on um, activities uh, for designing your own rain garden. And installation and maintenance um, is session four with um, a, a maintenance plan um, provided to you so that you can create your own. And we end with the, the demo garden installation. We also have uh, this flipped classroom type of model where people do at home learning assignments. And so when you come into the classroom setting, you're doing a lot of hands on activities. We also incorporate tours um, to different types of rainscaping sites throughout the community, which um, where this program is hosted. We typically run the programs twice a year in the spring and the fall. Uh, we're hoping we'll be able to do that um, as soon as we can. Uh, if not this year, then we'll absolutely have uh, rainscaping programs next year and we'll make sure to get the word out so you can hopefully join us. One of the features that we provide through our program too is this Rain Garden app. Um, the website is also listed there below. Um, this was created by the University of Connecticut, and we are a partner uh, within this app uh, design. We have um, created uh, a plant species list for Indiana, so you can go to the, um, either the app or the website, click on Indiana, and you can uh, select plants that are appropriate for rain gardens in different tolerance um, zones. We have, we spent quite a bit of time developing that plant list. So these are all plants that are appropriate for rain gardens. Um, they are also, um, we do have some horticultural favorites in there, but there are absolutely no invasive species listed. We do, uh, just as a, a caveat, uh, we do understand that there is an issue with the Android version of this app. There is a license issue. The um, Apple or iOS version works just fine and everything um, can also be found on the the website too, so you can continue to use that version. Our team members for the Rainscaping Education Program uh, is comprised of a our team is comprised of a multidisciplinary group of people uh, from both um, campus at Purdue Extension and um, throughout the state and county offices. Um, please reach out to any of us. We'd be happy to answer more questions or provide additional information about rains gardens and rainscaping. And uh, we are, uh, we're happy to also provide different opportunities for presentations uh, through our sessions too. And then finally, uh, please visit, it, visit us on our Rainscaping Education Program website. Uh, we have information, uh, some informational videos there, of course, the contact information and other types of uh, information for education. And if you'd like to contact John and me, please do uh, reach out um, through our email addresses here. So thanks very much for our um, overview of rainscaping and rain gardens today. And we'll take a few questions. I'm going to unmute John so that we can have the conversation. And I'll look through the chat here. And one of the questions, John, um, goes back to the um, rainscaping practices. It uh, lists, um, how does impervious pavement hold up over time in comparison tradi to traditional pavements? Well, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with the pervious pavement, but um, uh, maybe uh, Kara can talk more to that uh, question. So I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, so, yeah, so absolutely. It, um, does, so it does need more maintenance, doesn't it, mm -hmm. uh, Kara? Yeah. Uh, because you have to clean out um, the aggregate between the pavers and um, clean the dirt and debris that get in there because that will actually slow down the infiltration through those pavers. And so right. there is a little more maintenance involved. I do know that, but Kara, maybe you'd want to contact, you know, uh, 
comment on the on the question. Yeah, and it depends if you're using paver or the pavement. So there are two yeah. different kinds of options, and within those options, there are different kinds um, that are manufactured. So what you need to do is do your homework on um, this type of installation. Figure out. Um, what their, the maintenance requirements are, they do hold up well um, when they're maintained properly. And you do need to follow the manufacturing uh, manufacturer's requirements on those. Uh, some of them will need to be vacuumed um, so that they are making sure that debris is not clogging pores. Some of them will also need some of those um, chips uh, the, the small rock chips that are uh, refilled within the pore spaces um, to help with the infiltration um, on a periodic basis too. Uh, and then also making sure to hand weed out any other types of vegetation to maintain the flow. Sometimes you can get some buckling or places that um, are failing to, so you'll need to make sure that those are fixed. Uh, it it kind of depends on the area, how much traffic you're getting in a certain area, if it's a parking lot, because different kinds of the pavers or pavement are then constructed to, um, for different types of weights and frequency um, of vehicle traffic. So lots of options there and um, getting some more yeah. homework there is good. And I would, I would say too that just some observations of mine personally of the driveway down the street, it looks wonderful. I mean, the, the aesthetics of the, of the construction is really good and they've had that for at least seven years, if not more than that. And we know the, the person that has that home, uh, Kara and I both do, and I've not heard uh, them speak of any problems related to it holding up over time, at least the time that they've had it. So if that helps any. And another question, if I have a poorly drained area where there is nowhere for an overflow, can I instart, install large dry wells to hold excess water somewhere under or near the rain garden? Yeah, dry wells are definitely um, uh, something that you can use as a rainscaping practice. It, um, it takes a different type of construction to do that, and we don't cover that in as much detail in this session, uh, in our sessions, but um, that is an option. Something um, to think about for dry wells is that they do function similarly to rain gardens. So you need to make sure to channel it to that dry well. It has to have, um, you need to look at the um, construction for sizing it and having the appropriate type of stone in that. Uh, and then you need to uh, make sure the water is there and then you also uh, to the proper um, channel to, to the dry well. Um, so it could be an overflow from a rain garden that, that could work. Uh, but again, you'll need to think about considerations of how much water can infiltrate there and making sure that you have the proper infiltration um, because if you're having an area that's poorly drained, uh, you'll need to make sure that you have the right infiltration test to uh, be able to handle the water that you have on your site too. So do those infiltration tests and um, in a few places yeah. and make sure you know how much water, um, how much quantity of water you're wanting to. Yeah, Kara, not every, not every location is suitable for a rain garden. Exactly. And so you definitely need to make sure you do what, what Kara suggested and what we've suggested in this, do the infiltration test, make sure that you've got adequate drainage in the area. That defeats the purpose of a rain garden if it doesn't drain. And, um, and there may be other um, structures or drainage uh, that needs to be installed to correct your problem. And um, so the rain know. garden's not going to solve all those drainage issues. It may help. But yes, and you want to make sure that you're, um, you're not impacting neighbors or adjacent properties too, so yeah. that you are draining appropriately and maintaining it um, yeah. on your site or at least discharging it in a safe way if it needs to go to the um, storm drain. Yeah, we didn't talk about uh, proximity of a rain garden to, to property lines, and you want to be sure that if it is going to be close to a property line that you're um, fulfilling all those local requirements and talking to your neighbors, of course. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Are there any vegetables or edible plants that typically do well as a component of a rain garden? So we, at this time, we are not recommending um, edible plants in rain gardens or to be um, watered through um, rain barrels because of considerations of having uh, different types of bacteria or 
pollutants that are um, around those, those, that produce. So care and caution needs to be thought about um, for that type of um, planting because again, you're channeling water that's with, again, you want to try to maintain that first flush of dirty water, <laughs> uh, channel that to the rain garden so that it's helping to clean it. Uh, and so uh, thinking about that and um, edible plants is um, something that we exercise caution around. Um, we have that same level of caution with rain barrels and um, using them for irrigation. We have a really nice rain barrel installation video on, on our website, so you might want to check that out too. Um, mm -hmm. Talks about installation, but you don't want to water yeah, edible plants with, with rain water from a rain barrel. And we have a couple of logistics kinds of questions too. Um, is this available to see again? Yes, we are recording this and we will post it. Um, it will, we have to have it closed captioned and edited lightly. We will post it on um, YouTube and it will be available on Illinois Indiana Sea Grants um, Learning at Home series site. And we'll also post it through Purdue Extension and make it available on several different types of Purdue Extension sites, including our, our rainscaping site too. And um, as John mentioned, we have our rain barrel um, video available on our rainscaping site. We also have two siding and sizing videos too that go into a little bit more depth. Um, they are a subset of the learning, uh, the at home learning videos that we provide for our two day workshop. And um, someone also asked us um, how we, how to find out more information about uh, registering for the two-day workshop um, once stay at home is lifted. Um, how we run our programs is through um, the Purdue Extension County office um, in our Purdue Extension system. So we have uh, locations throughout the state um, twice a year. It just depends on which county office is interested in hosting and when we have those um, locations determined, we send out registration notifications. So we post that on our rainscaping site. We send it out through our Sea Grant social media, through our uh, Purdue Extension social media, Master Gardener social media, and several different types of, of ways. And then locally, they're uh, promoted to anyone can attend um, the, the sessions from throughout the state. But um, we many times will have a local then or regional focus uh, for people who are we're attending. And we did have a question about um, the address of our website again, and it's been posted in the chat, as well as the rain, guard, rain barrel videos. Excellent. Well, is there um, a final question or perhaps two final questions and then we will begin? We'll wrap yeah, up. Uh, Kara, I would say, just make a comment that there is a helpful links um, a page on our website that has some other um, helpful links and resources. So you may want to go and visit those for future and further learning. Um, also, the um, Blue Thumb Guide to Rain Gardens is um, is the book we use as a companion resource for our workshops. And um, that's also a really great resource as well. Absolutely. And um, when someone does attend our two-day session, we provide um, a curriculum uh, with more in-depth information, the Blue Thumb Guide to Rain Gardens, and then all kinds of resources for links and um, helpful tips and hints uh, to help you install a rain garden in your own residential space or in a small um, public space area too as a community endeavor. And there's a question about cost for the workshops, and uh, those Thanks. run somewhere between ninety and ninety-five dollars usually per person. Mm -hmm. uh, has been what they've been running in the past uh, year or two. So. Yeah, and we'll yeah. maintain that that price yeah. point. Yeah. Great. But that includes, uh, you know, that'll include the workshop itself, uh, workshop materials, the Blue Thumb Guide to Rain Gardens, and, and meals, um, lunches on both days. It's usually what that includes, if you're mm -hmm. wondering. So. Yes. All right. 
Well, thank you all very much for attending this short session, um, an introduction to rainscaping and rain gardens. We hope this sparks your interest to learn more about um, installing your own rain gardens. And hopefully you'll also join us for a future workshop and learning events um, for rain gardens and rainscaping. Thanks everyone for your time today. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out.